is first is you're not alone. I know that's kind of a crack thing to say, but you know, it's like I struggle, lots of people struggle and it takes a lot of courage to ask for help, but you need to. Like it took me, the first time I was depressed, it took me nine months to walk into a hospital and say, I need help. So that's the other thing I would say is somehow find the courage to tell someone in your circle, whether it's your friend or your family or a doctor, it doesn't matter. Go and find help. Welcome to Beyond the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and I'm excited to have another another guest today. And um, as you all know, we we find amazing guests who are actually, I mean, phenomenal guests, really, just to be honest. And uh, bringing them on, giving the opportunity for those of you who all might not know, to bring them on to share stories, strategies, and successes. Because, of course, that's the focus of Beyond the Ball, ultimately helping student athletes succeed beyond their degree, but hitting on those three stories, strategies, and successes. So now we're going to go ahead and just bring out today's guest. And, and this gentleman is a mental health advocate. He's a podcast host. And even in addition to that, he is a leadership coach. Now we're going to go ahead and bring out Mr. Rob Kalvaroski. Rob, how are we doing? Good. Thanks for having me, John. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I got the, I got the enunciation of the name correct, right? Better than a lot of people that I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh man. Well, Rob, look, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and kick it to you and uh go go ahead, just 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 take a little bit and uh just go ahead and for people who you know this might be their first introduction to you, go ahead and just you know, just just give a snippet on yourself and please go ahead and take this time. Yeah, so I mean, as you know, I mean, I'm the host of Dismantling the High Performance Narrative podcast with uh Lauren Williams, and John was a guest a few weeks ago. Um but yeah, we talk on that that podcast basically about mental health and performance and how us as high level athletes or people now in their business careers as entrepreneurs, we also struggle and it's OK to struggle. Um, I read other stuff about me. So I'm a I'm an MIT graduate. I have a mechanical engineering degree. I've worked in heavy industry for about 10 years now in mining, manufacturing, oil and gas consulting. And recently, I've started this journey into leadership, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But it's really something that I think as student athletes, I mean, we learn and we we experience good and bad leadership, but it's something to really lean into early in your career to get yourself where you need to be. So that's that's where I'm at today. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I love that. I love that. So M MIT, huh, Rob? MIT. Yeah, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get in. Um, incredible school, tons of incredibly smart, hardworking people. Yeah, it was an incredible experience. I mean, I have I have so many questions just about MIT, but and shoot, you, I'm you, open. You and then you graduated from MIT with a mechanical engineering degree. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so you would say math math comes easy to you. Not easy, but uh, it's definitely something that you can put in the reps and learn how to do. <laughs> Man, wow! Because I mean, MIT. When I hear MIT, you know, MIT is like, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of the it's absolutely one of the top engineering programs in the world. And when I was there, I think we were ranked number one or two, something like that. Wow. Okay. Okay. So when you talk just in the work that you're doing now. What, what, what was this something that that, that you all j just just in regards to like uh, what, what you were talking about, just um, the, the more so heavy duty work? Was this something that you envisioned earlier in your career, like before starting college? Was this was this where you saw yourself going just in regards in, in regards to career trajectory? Not really. Like and, and this is where the leadership aspect comes in. I think I took a lot of opportunities that came up for me. So like I. I was really passionate about playing water polo. I, I was on the junior national team in Canada. I won a national title. Um, I played some tournaments internationally. And then I sort of decided I didn't want to play. 
like I, I kind of had two options was like centralize and and try to make the senior men's national team or, or, you know, go to college. And I felt like college was the best option for me. Like the Canadian men's team hadn't made the Olympics since the eighties. So it didn't seem like that was a logical way to go. And so, yeah, I mean, I started looking at NCAA schools and I was lucky enough to get into MIT and something else that, that kind of came up was like, for me, my parents very much stressed that your degree needs to have a return on investment. Like you need to go somewhere, get a degree and that degree needs to get you a job. And then that job needs to be a decent job. And so that's where the engineering part came in is it was an easy way to get a four year degree that gets you a job. Um, how I ed actually ended up in heavy industry was kind of a fluke. Like I, I took a friend of mine to a hockey game in Ottawa and I met, her friend who worked in mining at the time. And basically she was like, Hey, we're always hiring engineers, send me your resume. And like literally five months later, I started at a coal mine in British Columbia. So it was, it was kind of a fluke thing that was definitely not planned. Okay. Okay. And then water polo, talk, talk, talk a little bit about that because that's not something that you, you hear people talk about too, too often. Was this something that you, like, like we're introduced at, at a young age or what, what, what's your introduction with water polo and, and then even how that continued just to roll? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I started playing polo when I was nine years old. And so like my parents were very early on the, the like anti-concussion type of thinking. And so hockey was out, football was out. Um, I can't really run that well. So, so basketball and soccer are also out. And then, yeah, like I got in the pool and it just, it just sort of clicked for me. And like, yeah, I got real serious about it really quickly. Like a lot of my coaches were former Olympians. Um, some of them were from overseas, like from Eastern Europe. And, you know, I started training, you know, seven to nine times a week, basically when I was started to be like 12 or 13. And that continued all the way through like basically through till I was 18 years old and then went to college. So yeah, it was, it was a really serious thing for me um, really quickly. What was it like walking away from walking away from the sport after you've invested that much, especially like you said, you were, you know, going in multiple times a week and investing a lot of time. And, and then now you, you decide to, to walk away from walk, walk away from the game. How, how'd that impact you? It's tough, right? Like when I started in mining, at the town I lived in didn't even have a team. So it was like, it wasn't even an option. Um, I, I still, well, pre-COVID, I was playing here probably two, two, three times a week. So I still like to get in the pool, but it's hard. And I, I think it's something that we forget about as athletes is like our career is going to end at some point. And like, whether that's when we're 22 and graduate college or whether that's, you know, when we're like, you know, 30 or 40 or whatever. Right. And I think it's like, and this is something that I'm still working on is like, you need to replace and sort of balance your life because otherwise when something ends, it's like, you're kind of floundering to try to figure out what you're supposed to do. Man. Yeah. So what balance have you put, have you put in place since, you know, to help you just, just like, like level, level out your life and just, just with the work that you're doing now. <laughs> I'm still working on balance, John. Like it's literally a conversation I had with my therapist probably two weeks ago. Um, because for me, I think, and I think a lot of athletes will resonate with this is it my life. I've been trained to have singular focus and that singular focus leads to success. And so it was like basically from, I don't know, 11 or 12 till, till 18, 19, my singular focus was on water polo. How do I get better every day at this? How do I succeed at this? How do we win games? How do I get better? Um, then when I got to college, like I was still playing, but just at the academic load had to kind of take priority. So it became, how do I think all the time about MIT, about every class I'm taking, about what do I need to do today to, to learn, to get the A's in the classroom? And then really since college, it's been really difficult for me because I haven't had a singular focus Like my job. And, and I think a lot of people resonate with this is like, I found my college 
experience a lot more difficult than my working experience. The job that I do now, it's like, and my entire career has been, you know, fairly easy. There's not that huge deadlines. There's not significant workload. And so you you really need to broaden your horizons. And for me, I've leaned into like entrepreneurship lately and like hosting the podcasts and like doing that type of stuff. But like what's really worked for me, I guess in this last few months is I got a puppy. And so he's added a lot of elements to my life about like love and compassion and just even companionship that I was lacking before. Wow. So you said you feel that college was more stressful from like now day to day, what you, what you do in the, in the working world? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't even think it's that close to be honest. Like um, I, I think, I mean, that's, it's part of the load, right? Like, like MIT, we were training probably two, we were training about two and a half hours a day, six days a week. So what's that? 15 hours a week plus, you know, plus games and tournaments and stuff. And then the academic workload was extremely brutal. Um, and yeah, like right now I work a full-time job. I consult part-time. I run two podcasts and we just launched a leadership program and I still feel like I have lots of time in the day to do everything. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I can't imagine how rigorous your college, your, your college schedule was if everything that you just mentioned, you said a full-time job, you said you got two podcasts in addition to launching the leadership program. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, Rob, I'm, I'm fearful of, of college Rob. Like what? Oh my goodness. That's a lot, man. It's, it's a lot, but yet for me, it was the perfect environment. And, and like, I, I read this news story before the Super Bowl and it, they were talking about Tom Brady and how he kicked out like Giselle and his kids out of his his like huge mansion for two weeks just so he could solely dial in on the Super Bowl. And I was like, I understand that because I am that too. And mm -hmm. and that was the thing was like basically my entire career was was – just obsessing over the next thing I would need to do to get it done. So then I could get success in the classroom or success in the pool. And like, this has been a skill that every one of your listeners have have trained as part of their athletic career. And I think like when you step out, like basically my therapist called me an addict the last, like a few weeks ago, she said, you're addicted to success. Mm. You're addicted to this, these feelings of achievement and I think it's something that when you when you think about balance, you're trying to get away from that one element. And like, I'm not saying it's healthy. It's definitely not healthy because it's led to like severe depression in me. But, uh, you know, it's it's just I think it's a product of how we're raised. Mm, yeah. Where do you think the line is like but between being because if they're like if I guess if obsession for success is like here, but then being stagnant is here, like where, where's the line? How do you, how do you identify where the line is and how do you identify if it's like, if it's too far or if, yeah, if, if it's just too much. Yeah. The line is difficult, but really what it comes down to is, are you able to survive without success in that one area? And, and really what that means is, are you able to validate yourself and the work that you're doing yourself? And that's the part that we don't learn as athletes, right? Is like basically what we're taught is if you score goals, if you get points, if you get assists, if you get playtime, if you get minutes, if you win, these are the external validators that we look for to judge whether we're doing well or not. Um, those go away in the working world. Like you'll, you'll get performance reviews maybe once a year. Um, you'll have deadlines, depending on if you're in consulting or just in a regular job, you'll have deadlines. But a lot of the times, basically you submit a report or you'll do a project and like you're not getting too much feedback. Like people will say you're doing fine or, you know, but it's not this like 
very easily driven metric based. Like I can look at the results and say, Hey, I did this. And I think that's the, the part that's, that's where the balance is, is if you can, and this is what I struggle with too, is like, if, if something that you like, let's say, you know, you're launching a program and nobody signs up, if that's catastrophic for you, then you're not, you don't have enough balance. But if you're able to say like, Hey, you know, I put in great work on this program. I see the work that I did and I know it's quality and maybe I need to make a few adjustments or maybe I pitched it to the wrong audience. Like these are, you know, some things I can do better next time. Then I think that that's more where you need to be as, as an entrepreneur, as a person. Wow. Rob, this, this is really good. This is really, <laughs> this is really good. I mean, because I spend are, a lot of time on the mic, Jonathan. <laughs> man, yeah, man. Because I mean, th- th- these are these are these are conversations that I don't think we have as often in, in really just assessing, especially as we look through the lens of going from college to career or college to corporate. Like we see the thing that's shiny. We we see the the pay. Or, you know, if we know about benefits, then we see the benefits, but ultimately we don't see what we're losing or we don't see what, like what we need essentially going from, because like, that's huge thinking about going from being, you know, a a star athlete or being an athlete, because for me, I I was a division three athlete, but even then after the games, you know, you go to the parties, people, people know your name because you're an athlete and then you go like and, and and you know celebration is the external motivators of like how society lets us know oh good job good job we see you <laughs> we celebrate you but then what happens when there there's no more hand claps there's no more there's no more pats on the back then 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 where where is my space in the world <sighs> you i mean you're so right and i'll tell you my experience right so when i started my career I was working as an economist. I was making like $52,000 a year. And I told you the part where I met this woman who worked in mining and and the job opportunity was like, it's an engineering job. It was going to pay me basically like another $25,000, $30,000 a year. But it was in this small town. There was no polo. There wasn't like, I didn't know anyone out there. And it was like, what's the decision? Like I could live in a city. I could play polo on my regular you know, on my regular team, I could have all of my friends there. I could do the things that I was normally doing, or I could move out there and make like 50% more money, but lose all that other stuff. And I took that decision about moving out there because basically because my parents were like, well, the money's good and it's in the career that you studied in college. And, you know, it led to like years of depression that I'm still working through. And so I think it's like, that's the part that I talk about in this personal leadership stuff. And what you kind of mentioned is what are your values and like, what are the things that you love to do? Those are non-negotiables like that extra 25,000 a year. It's not going to like meaningfully affect your happiness on a day-to-day basis. And then and then even in our honesty, because coming coming out of college, if you don't necess- if you don't have that extra twenty five thousand, then you're you're able to live without it. But then when you get it, of course, you know, you increase your lifestyle and certain <laughs> things you might might go out to eat a little bit more, go to the bar a little bit more, go to different places, just a little bit more based on having that. But still, you know, if if you end up being depressed at the end of the day, is is it worth it? Like, was the decision worth it? It's like, hmm. <laughs> it's probably not. <laughs> yeah. 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 Man, probably not. Man, these are these are these are some this is a good conversation, Rob. I, I've never I, I I didn't look through from the lens of of, of your perspective, because I'm not you, but it's this make this makes a lot of sense. It, this this makes it's a lot of sense. So so like now if if as you look through look back over your life, right, and you just think of what would be like either your biggest failure or a failure that as you, as you see it, right. What, what are, what are you able to extract from that, from that failure? Yeah. I mean, honestly, 
I'm not sure I would call it failure. I think where I am at my life is is really in this mode of pivoting. Um, and it's really this this element of self-discovery, right? Like I've been living my life a lot and, and I had this thought the other day in therapy was like, I've never made a decision for myself basically ever. And I'm now I'm 32 years old. And so I think that's the real key piece that I want people to take away is even the first question is just understanding who you are. Because probably about if you would have met me a year and a half ago and asked me who I am, I would have said, hey, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm a polo player, and I'm like a podcast host. And it's like, these are these are titles and resume items that we've done. They're not exactly who we are. And now I would say something like I'm a leader, you know, I care about helping people. I want to impact a lot of people in both mental health and leadership spaces. You know, I want to, you know, change people's lives for the better. And I think it's very much more driven from this place of, of impact and, you know, why I'm here, which is, which in an essence, like I had to go through these, like the depression, the suicide attempt, and like all this other stuff to find the path out. And then that path out is where I'm going now. That's really prolific, Rob. That's really <laughs> prolific. Really, like it, I mean, it, it it really is just just the level of awareness that 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 you've come to, just just based on that. Because right, you said the the you know the water polo player you know the this the that the that and listing it off going back to like what we were talking about before because yes those those things are great conversation starters right and and those things are also when when you say that you probably hear responses like oh i've never met a water polo player D depending on region <laughs> you know depending on region where, where where you connect with the individual but the other way just like you said it, it, it's more it's more other centered it's more of a other centered approach Versus a, I guess you can say, selfish centered approach, if you will. <laughs> wow. What 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 would you say has led to that though? Like for you to be more more others focused, and and you now to be more more service focused or, or leadership minded. Help help me out, Rob. Help me out. Yeah, and that's really where some of the elements that we're going to bring into the leadership program that Lauren and I are doing and, and the work I've done with Lauren's boss is, is really led to that. And it's really been more of this connecting to who you are, understanding your values, understanding what you're good at and what you're able to, to do and just realizing, I guess, why you're here. And, and I don't know that's a tough question to say to people. Like if I was 21 and you would have said to me, why are you here? Like, I don't have an answer for that. I wouldn't have an answer for that. But I think the, the experiences that we all go through, whether they're easy or difficult or they push us or they don't, they all end up in this place where you can draw meaning from it. And I think we all, I mean, meaning is a need. Like if you, if you ask and you, if you take this like nihilistic point of view and say the world doesn't have meaning, you can get really dark really quickly. And I think that's where it is, is you have to ascribe the pain that you've gone through or the trauma or, you know, these hard working situations or you, you achieving success after working hard in an athletic career, like these things have to have meaning. And so you have to find what's the meaning on the other side. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that because if you, if you don't attribute meaning to the other end of the side, just like you said, that, that really will go, down really fast really quickly <laughs> like really really quickly because it can it can be so easy to find you know find something to upset you versus being intentional and shifting like something i know that's been more popular as of late it seems like it's it's really popular um but but gratitude even though i mean people have been saying gratitude for years but when you start hearing people like gary v say it then it it, it blows up it, it blows up man Gratitude, I, I like. I honestly like. I really struggle with gratitude, and I don't know what it is. I'm sure there's some element of like vulnerability that I can't get to yet. Mm -hmm. But but I really think like yeah, it absolutely works if you can get there. 
I think the other aspect is just like, yeah, you, you need something that you feel is going well for you. And that's where the gratitude is kind of connected Mm -hmm. is like, you're looking for elements in your life that are positive where a lot of people's brains, and this is a survival thing is like, you look for the negative because you want to distance yourself from the negative. Cause it's like, you know, you're in a cave and there's a bear coming and you want to run away. Right. Um, but life's not like that anymore. Like most of us are not dealing with like acute physical danger. And so it's like very much, we, we can work on our mind and shift it towards seeing the positives. Mm. Do you think gratitude is something you, you struggle with because you're, you're, you're used to, like striving for such like a high level, like competing at a high level, desiring to, you know, win the trophy, to to do this, to do that. And it's always like you're always looking up. Yeah. And that's that's a thing like I'm sure most people who are listening to this will will resonate with is it's it's a perfectionist type strategy, right? And it's I only will be successful if I get the top trophy, you know, or if I'm the MVP, if I score the most goals, if I get the highest grades, like all these things. And it's, it, it comes from a place of like lack of self-worth because you're trying to prove to the world by achievement that you belong or you're worthy of being alive. And a lot of that stuff, like I had a, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, he's out of finance. And he said, some of the, the people say that, the hedge fund managers that make billions of dollars, it's they got there because they didn't want to go to therapy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Wow. Right. But but before, before we get to the two minute drill and we're going, we're going to wrap this thing up, man, I've been enjoying our (laughs) conversation. Um, But I I want you, I want you to talk a little bit more about a high performance narrative because I don't think you talked about high performance narrative. And then also, also just, just, just talk a little bit about Lauren as well because everybody might not know Lauren. Um, so if you could talk about those two, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah. So I'll start with Lauren. She's, she's the co-host of dismantling the high performance narrative. She, she's been a high level women's hockey player for a long time. She was trying out for team Canada. She was on team Ontario. She went to university of Wisconsin and won a national title with them. Uh, she, she was the first overall pick of the Worcester blades. Uh, that's the women's pro league in the U S and now she's a currently a high performance coach. Um, and so we've partnered together to, to do this podcast called dismantling the high performance narrative, really to talk about a lot of the stuff we touched on today. So mental health performance and, and basically these elements of what made us successful in our athletic careers, what made us successful in our academic careers, what made us successful in our entrepreneurship or working careers is actually these beliefs about ourselves or these conversations that we're having where we are struggling, but yet we're pretending that everything's perfect. And like, basically like I'm a prime example of this, right? Like I work all those jobs that Jonathan and I talked about like 10 minutes ago, and yet I still struggle with depression and suicide on a daily basis. You know, Lauren, she told this story about trying out for Team Canada and literally crying in her closet at night. And we were trained as athletes to like suck it up, you know, rub some dirt on it, get back on defense, like all these things. And yet those types of strategies about suck it up are going to are killing us or will kill us eventually. So that's where we go with the podcast. It's, It's about opening space for these vulnerable conversations about you know, it's not everything needs to be perfect, that we're all real people, regardless if we're achieving the most or the, or the most things that in our circle, like that's what it's about. Um, yeah. And a, and a little bit off that, like Lauren and I are doing, we just launched a leadership program called the leadership Launchpad on Friday. And it's, it's basically about a lot of the stuff we talked about today. It's about learning and connecting with your values it's about becoming a personal leadership in your own life. And then if you're in a career or you're in your community or you're in your family, becoming a leader for the people around you and really leaning into impact. So service of others and really understanding and taking your story 
and distilling it into an impact that you can go out and have in the world. So if you're interested in that, you know, you can go to highperformancenarrative.com slash leadership, all the stuff's there. So that's it. <laughs> boom, boom. Right. Before we get into Andrew, I have to I have to ask you this also, because just from what you shared, it really just spurred the thought in my mind. But if, if there was somebody out there who who, who also is, is battling, uh, you know, having suicidal thoughts, like like what, what word of encouragement would you give them? What tip or, or, or what, what advice or insight would you share um, with, with that individual just to help them, you know, navigate uh, through through this tough just, to, you know, this this tough. Age? Yeah. I would say, honestly, is first is you're not alone. I know that's kind of a crack thing to say, but, you know, it's like I struggle. Lots of people struggle and it takes a lot of courage to ask for help, but you need to. Like it took me the first time I was depressed. It took me nine months to walk into a hospital and say I need help. So that's the other thing I would say is somehow find the courage to tell Someone in your circle, whether it's your friend or your family or a doctor, it doesn't matter. Go and find help. And and like an, another, I guess another tip is likely the first medication and the first therapist won't be the ones that you're looking for. So you'll have to continually ask until you find a path that works for you. Like it just, that's the way mental health is. It's not an exact science. And so it, it's very much trial and error, but you, you just got to keep asking until you find what works. There we go. There we go, Rob. Thank you for sharing that, man. Thank, thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm sure that will encourage some people um, j- just out there because I know everyone isn't isn't as vocal. So, you know, uh, somebody who who catches this in their in their earbuds or they see us on YouTube, um, hoping that's going to add some value. So So thank you for that, my friend. Yeah, I hope I, I honestly like that's the hardest part I really believe is with mental health is the the asking and then when because like I'm I've been on 15 different medications. I've tried a bunch of different therapies and therapists. And I think like the hardest part is when you try something new and it and it doesn't work or it makes you worse. And I think like continually asking until you find is I mean it's a war, but that's I mean you have to do it if you want to get out. That makes sense. That that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now on on a on a on a lighter note, on a little bit of a lighter <laughs> note, uh, we're going we're going to transition into the two minute drill. And uh, Rob, the two minute drill, and for everybody else out there, you know, this might be a first time listening. The two minute drill is where I'm going to have Rob on. I'm going to ask a couple of rapid fire questions, and then I'm going to let Rob share with everybody where they can connect with him, how they can find him, and you know, just follow and and get connected. So, Rob, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. (laughs) All right. All right. And here we go. Favorite food? Pizza. Okay. Okay. What's what's your go-to streaming show of preference? Streaming show of preference. Ooh, that's a hard one. I think, what are we, what have we been watching lately? We're watching The Circle right now. Oh, I've been hearing about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I need to check that out. I need to check that out. What's, what's the last book you read? The last book I read is called Radical Acceptance. Um, it's a really interesting therapy book with some elements of like mindfulness and, and Buddhism. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, what's your what's your favorite podcast? <laughs> um, my favorite podcast is this one. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't put this in here for people to say that. I really put it so other people can hear. You know what other people's favorite podcasts are. I'm trying to think, actually. So I like I've actually really liked a bit of optimism by Simon Sinek. I think there's a lot of elements that he's my favorite leadership guru, but there's a lot of elements there that I love. Okay, okay, good deal. And what's what's one tip that you would leave for a student athlete? Take your time. One tip. I would say it's it comes back to personal leadership. It's really understand yourself. And then from un- that understanding, you'll be able to really be intentional about your life. And then the last question, who's one guest that you would like to see me interview on Beyond the Ball next? <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I mean, I mean, Lauren would be an incredible guest. She's she's really good. And another person that that I've been trying to get on my show has been Hayden Hurst. So he's a he's an NFL tight end, and he talks a lot about his struggles with mental health. And I think he would be he'd be an incredible guest. <laughs> okay, okay, good deal, excellent, excellent. Well, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kick it to you, Rob. Let people know where they can find you, how they can follow you, and and and, and get connected. Go ahead and do that. This. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, thanks, John, for having me. Definitely, like, I have two podcasts now. So Dismantling the High Performance Narrative is the one on mental health and performance. I also host one called The Leadership Launchpad Project. Both of those are available, Apple, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, all these areas. So definitely check those out if you're interested. If you want to check out our website, you can go to highperformancenarrative.com. The leadership program's on there. Uh, the bios for Lauren and I are on there. You can get connected if you want us to speak or anything. Basically, the only social media I use is LinkedIn, so you can follow me there. Uh, Rob Kalvaroski, I'm connected with John, so so definitely you can find me that way, and I'd I'd love to love to chat with you. Excellent, excellent. Well, Rob, thank you again for for coming on for for sharing, um, being vulnerable, and you know just 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 being an amazing individual. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. And and John, we'll have to we'll have to get you back on on the other show and, and go deeper, you know? <laughs> sure thing. Sure thing. I'm open. I'm open. To all the ballers out there, all the ballers listening, I would encourage you all to connect. Be sure to connect with Rob. Uh, he, he's, he's really a great guy. Uh, he, he's been a faithful supporter of Beyond the Ball. And I even had the opportunity to to hop on uh, dismantling the high performance narrative. Uh, with, with with him and his, his co-host Lauren, who is also phenomenal. Like like they have a great show over there. So you all definitely want to connect with them, and you wanna you definitely want to give their show a listen. And before I let you all go, you know I have to just encourage you all to make sure that you subscribe to Beyond the Ball. Uh, we're on Apple, of course, and you can go on YouTube and you can type in Beyond the Ball podcast with Jonathan Jones, and I'll pop up. Subscribe there, and you'll get you know be able to hear Beyond the Ball as well as other exclusive video content. So once again, uh, thank you all for listening to Beyond the Ball. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, where we help you succeed beyond your degree. What's going on?